An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on. It's, it's an, an idea. idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. So, critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, two egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, zany, politically incorrect. Your style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be new to the fullest. Hello everybody and welcome to yet another edition of Paradigm Shift, an educational comedy. And today, I saw a post on Facebook posted by Rochelle DeYoung and um, the post should be on your screen right now. It's called Eight Things to Give Up. And I want to go over these because even though, yeah, these are correct, you know, these are, these are completely cool, and I, I agree with this list wholeheartedly. Seeing as reality is a cake and not a light switch, and depending on the reality configuration, anything can be viewed in just about any way. I mean, just like, you know, how Hitler said it's easy enough to make people see heaven is hell and hell is heaven and so on and so forth. There are some very common inherent traps in this list. I mean, this list is well intended, don't get me wrong, and I don't disagree with this list. I'm just wanting to go over um, the trappings of each one and just provide some clarifications. So just so you know, I'm not disagreeing with this list. I'm expanding on this list so that this list can be more helpful to you. Okay, the first one, doubting yourself. Now, with all of these, including the first one, of course, because we are programmed by society to go from one extreme to the other, like, oh, if you don't like something, run to its polar opposite. If something is true, then its polar opposite must be false. We view life in terms of black and white. So what ends up happening, and we don't realize it when it's happening, is instead of getting off of the per proverbial hamster wheel, we're just running in one direction on the wheel, then we're running in the other, thinking that we're escaping the wheel, right? But we're, we're still on the wheel. So no matter which extreme path you take, all roads lead to Rome, as it were. In other words, you get two different versions of the same outcome. So, okay, number one, doubting yourself. Don't doubt yourself. But the thing is, is that when we try to avoid doubting ourselves, when we go in that opposite stream of uh, that opposite um, direction of, oh my God, I got to, I got to avoid doubting myself. You can literally go nuts doing that, like. You can, uh, you can have so much doubt that arises in your ability to not doubt yourself. Oh crap, I'm doubting myself again. I keep finding myself doubting myself. I'm failing at, at, at not doubting myself. Oh God, you know. Or then there's the people that cover up with, with a, a fake layer of confidence. Like they're, they're still doubting themselves. They're shoving it down deep. And they're going, I'm confident, see, look at me, I'm so confident, oh, I'm holding it in like a constipated shit, it's gonna blow, ah! you know. So, 
we've all I think we've all seen people do this sort of stuff to themselves and it's it's very neurotic. It's amusing in one way, but mostly just fun with a capital F you and not really so amusing. So the first thing to do, in my opinion, from my perspective, in my experience, <clears throat> if you want to stop doubting yourself, then just fully let yourself doubt yourself. Because you can't change what you don't own. And if you're not owning your thoughts, and you're not owning your feelings, and you're not giving yourself the right to them, even the most nastiest of them, if you're not giving yourself that right, then you are literally in resistance to your own right to think and feel things. And it creates a negative feedback loop, like speaking into a microphone, and it comes out the speaker, and then back into the microphone, and back out the speaker, and so on. And it only takes just a little tiny bit of that to start off, and the oscillation just makes it, it's like, and it ends up building up into this avalanche of anxiety, and, and pressure, and, and doubt. You know, so it's like the more you try to quote unquote stop doubting yourself, you give up doubting yourself, the more you're oscillating doubt inside of yourself. Because in order to step off the hamster wheel, you, you got to own that wheel. You got to, it's, you know, it, it's like quitting drinking. You know, the first step to recovery is to admit that you're an alcoholic. You know what I mean? To own that, to be like, all right, fine. You know, I'm an alcoholic. It is what it is. <laughs> you know, to just get to that place of being at peace with your dysfunction. Because being at peace doesn't mean you accept it. It doesn't mean you like it. It's not saying, oh, well, I'm an alcoholic, fuck it, it's, that's the only real reality. I may as well just accept and be at peace with the fact that I'm going to be a drunken bastard all my life. No, 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 it's not, not what I mean by acceptance and being at peace with it. In other words, you, you have to accept that, that the rock is the rock in order to realize that it's hard and know what to do with it. You have to accept and own that fire burns in order to realize what it is and know what to do with it. Otherwise, you're going to be hurting yourself with with rocks and fire, or you're going to be scared shitless of them, and every time you see a rock or see someone light up a lighter, you're going to like go into a total anxiety fucking freak out. You know what I mean? You're just going to like flip your shit. And maybe be like one of these social justice warriors demanding your safe space and, and needing some muscle over here. But yeah, anyway, so point made on point one. Point two, negative thinking, things to give up, negative thinking. In the context that it's meant as, I agree. But unfortunately, the context that people are subconsciously programmed with by society when it comes to the idea of negative thinking. Their ego just goes into overdrive because we're taught to be arrogant. We're taught to be addicted to feeling self-righteous and justified and addicted to our victimization because it makes us feel self-righteous and so on. So the very first thing that happens when we think of negative thinking is anything our little fragile, insecure, butthurt egos do not like is negative. And unfortunately, that goes more into a denial state. It's like, oh, cockroaches are so negative. If, if, if I ignore that they're in the walls, maybe they'll go away and leave me alone. And no, they'll just keep breeding in the walls until they're like all over the countertops and the floor and falling from the ceiling. And it's, you know, it's, it's just not cool. So information that you don't like is not negative simply just because you don't like it. To acknowledge, oh my god, look at that mess over there that needs to be cleaned up is actually a very positive thing. It's just information. There's no such thing as negative information. Information is just information. It's freaking neutral. So when you can acknowledge the mess, acknowledge the elephant in the room, acknowledge the problem, and do it without judging it as bad or evil or dark and not fucking have an anxiety, obsessive, compulsive, neurotic, total pathological freak out over it, 
then you could calmly look at the mess and go, yeah, it's, it is what it is. Let's look at the, the details of that mess, the nature of that mess. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big mess there. And you're looking at it calmly, then you could start to troubleshoot, go into solutions mode instead of, oh my god, a problem, I'm going to freak out now and panic and just abuse myself because, oh no, a problem, ah! You know, so instead of doing that, we can then look at it like a computer technician looks at a computer because, I mean, let's face it, if a computer technician sat down at a computer and an error message popped up on the screen and he started like fucking flipping out and like crouching up into a ball in front of the computer and going, oh my god, no, an error, oh, whatever will I do, the world is over, ah! Obviously the computer tech would not be a very good computer tech, the computer would not get fixed, and your computer would be completely fucked until or unless you happen to find a competent computer technician. Well, you are the computer tech to your own brain. Like, and not on the physical level, I'm not suggesting anybody crack their head open and try to perform brain surgery on themselves, obviously not. I mean when it comes to your thoughts, your beliefs, your perceptions, you are the boss. And of course, those do affect the physical, and you can do a YouTube search for Bruce Lipton, who talks a lot about that, but I'm not going to segue into that. But you, you can look at more on that if you'd like. So... Anyway, when you can just calmly look at a mess and go, all right, here's, here's a mess, just like a computer, all right, here's an error, it's time to fix this. Then you can troubleshoot and actually figure out how to fix the damn thing. And that moves into number three, the fear of failure. Once you realize, oh, I'm, I'm actually calm now and I'm, I'm seeing the details of the problem and I'm calmly looking at it and okay there's this mess here and I'm troubleshooting how to clean it up and oh my god I, I've got the solution it's great I know exactly how we can get this cleaned up this is wonderful all of a sudden fear of failure kicks in but how am I going to learn how to do that I don't know how to do it how am I going to learn how to do it and even if I can learn how to do it where am I, I going to get the tools to learn how to do it and if, if if I totally just can't learn how to do it then how am I going to find somebody to work with me who knows how to do it and, ah! and so then there's this big huge anxiety about that right and um, that that aspect of that actually falls into you know some of these other numbers down down on the, on the list here well we'll get to that we're going to connect the dots here so, okay, fear, fear of failure. Um, well, winners fail until they succeed. Losers, <laughs> ironically, give up. Yeah, eight things to give up. Losers give up um, at the first sign of failure. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, give up in the context of this post is to, to be willing to surrender or do, a, do away with that that has been holding you back, to, to untie yourself from that anchor of bullshit that's been weighing you down. So, fear of failure is basically um, what we're taught that errors are bad. Oh my god, it's a sin to learn anything. You can't have a trial and error process. You can't, you can't make mistakes and learn from them and go stronger from that and, and then, and then practice it again and then make another mistake and become wiser and more knowledgeable and more intelligent from having learned from that and then, and then keep going until eventually you're not making a mistake with it because you've had so much practice and you've gotten so badassedly frickin' good at it that you you're just just a walking cup of awesome. Oh no, you can't do that. You have to 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 view the trial and error process of learning as making you weak and incompetent and and stupid and oh, you made a mistake. You terrible person. Yeah. Yeah, which basically then leads into the number 4, criticizing others cuz let's face it, we we fear others doing it to us because we are perfectly fucking, you know, happy to, to do it to somebody else. We, when we get into that justified node. But here's the thing. It's not really criticism that we need to give up. Because let's face it, you can criticize someone nicely. You can criticize someone without being a douchebag. And even if your opinion is so blunt that it can't help but be rude, you know, like my opinions oftentimes are, like eight times out of ten, you can at least respect someone's right 
to react how they're going to react, to judge you, to, to dislike you, to hate you, to condemn you, whatever. You can at least respect their right to, to their opinion to that. Because, you see, feeling human emotion, even if it's condemnation, even if it's like that person over there is a doo-doo head, that level of criticizing, it's not... It doesn't make you a bad, horrible person to feel that. It doesn't even make you a bad, horrible person to quite openly be blunt about exactly your thoughts and feelings on it. But this is where using discernment, you know, kind of kind of kicks in. Um, as far as what level of intensity of expression, you know, the right tool for the right job. Not every tool requires a hammer, because not every problem is a nail. You know what I mean? So, like... If I'm criticizing someone's attitude, let's say, you know, someone's just being a, a total douchebag. Let's, I mean, above and beyond. Like, wow. Like, yeah, like, I've got some real reason for my ego to feel justified here. That's like, wow, you know. First of all, if I'm respecting their right to be a douchebag, then I'm not letting it get me all hot and bothered. It's just like, okay, you know. I'm not really surprised when a dog barks, so I'm not really shocked when a douchebag acts like a fucking moron. Hostile fucking moron, usually. So, yeah, you know, so... When you're kind of owning and accepting the nature of that, then they're not really able to get you intimidated or get you steamed any more than you're like, Oh my God, how dare that dog be a dog? Or how dare that cat be a cat? The audacity, some nerve, that bastard. No, you're accepting <laughs> the nature of it. So you don't react like that to doggies and kitties. So why act like that to douchebags? That's number one. Number two, it's like, then you have to make a conscious de decision based on your right to be in whatever mood you're in. Like, okay, as per my preferred state of being, and by the way, preferred state doesn't necessarily mean bunnies and kitties and rainbows. Sometimes our preferred state is middle fingers and fuck yous, and that's okay, because we're human and we're allowed to do that. So it's like, all right, what is my preferred state? What What is that, you know? What do I prefer right now? Whether it's it's happiness and bliss, or whether it's middle fingers and fuck yous, or, or whatever else in between. What am I really, really preferring at the moment? And let's say in this instance, for example, we're referring, we're preferring the more blissful, happy, you know, whatever, that sort of approach. Then you can respond to the douchebag in, in the nicest possible way. As a matter of fact, you can even be a bit devious about it as long as you're authentic and we'll be getting to authenticity by the way um you can even be a bit devious about it just be so like overly polite that it's disgusting and you end up being like insufferable to them and now they don't want to be a douchebag to you anymore because not only can they not get your goat but you're just like killing them with kindness but it has to be authentic kindness it can't be a tactic it can't be like oh well i'm going to pretend to be nice and pretend to respect them and then they'll get mad and they'll go away no that's not going to be their first reaction that's probably going to be like their 18th or 300th freaking reaction you know everything before is going to make the assumption that oh they're trolling me they're they're trying they're pulling a bluff I'm going to bust their bubble I'm going to call their bluff and then they'll get mad and cry like a little bitch and then I'll be able to dominate them <laughs> you know so you have to really authentically have that as your preferred state of being, that you really authentically want to be so nice and sick. That that is literally your authentic preferred state of being at the time. You have to really legitimately actually respect their, like, real, true, honest-to-God respect of their right to just, you know, be who they are, as douchebaggy as that might be. Otherwise, they're going to break your bluff, like, in 10 seconds flat and they're gonna own your ass it's just gonna be done they win you lose game over and you're taking a ride to Butterville. so being honest and authentic is is very important to maintaining self-control um people also tend to confuse confuse authenticity with things like truth and honesty and though truth, honesty, and authenticity are interrelated, just like um, sports cars, semi-trucks, and motorcycles are interrelated, they're all based on the same technology, uh, there's still three expressions of that technology that have fundamental differences. You can't treat a semi-truck like a motorcycle and, you know, etc. 
um, and vice versa, and so on, because if you do, you're going to run into some obvious problems. From my, uh, from my perspective, authenticity is simply you giving yourself the right to maintain your own integrity that you're not bullshitting yourself you're not you're not in, in denial with yourself you're not trying to hide anything inside of you from from yourself that you're at that that stable level authenticity has more to do with your relationship between you and you than it does with anybody else Honesty, I think, has more to do with with um, your relationships with others. Because if, if you're authentic with yourself, obviously you're going to be honest with yourself. So, you know, we already covered that with authenticity. So, honesty is more in the context of, you know, are you an honest person? Like, how are you treating others? How are you dealing with others? What are you, what are you saying to others? Are you, you know, are you honest? Are you reliable? Are you dependable? Or are you a lying, game-playing bastard you know I mean honesty I think is is you know on that level like how you how you deal with others are you are you dealing with others in in an honest way and you know by honest I don't mean always being nice to people because it's like if you really don't like somebody and you act like like you're their best buddy because you feel like oh well if I don't treat them nice then I'm doing something wrong and I'm being naughty like, no, you're already being naughty by being frickin' dishonest, because that's called a fake friend or a fair-weather friend, and, like, you know, every, everybody hates fair-weather friends, right? You know, I, everybody, I think, has said, man, you know, I wish they would have just said it to my face that they don't like me, instead of talking behind my back. Because if I would have known that they don't like me, I wouldn't have wasted my time with them, and they wouldn't have had to waste their time with me. God, I wish they would have just been honest, <laughs> you know. So it's like not even the idea that, that that person didn't like you that even bothers you. Like, you can handle that if they didn't like you. It's like, okay, well, fuck them, whatever, you know, moving on. It's the fact that they acted like they're your buddy and they lied to your face and they're just this bold-faced fucking liar. And that that is what, like, really seems people, right? Like, my God. That bastard just slid straight to my face. What the fuck is their problem? But if you look at it on the flip side of the coin, put yourself in their situation, if they've got a societal program saying, if I'm not nice to the people that I don't like, then then I'm a horrible, terrible person. I've committed the worst sin. I'm 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 you know doing the most worst possible horrible thing, and I'll be shunned and branded as a as a rude, unprofessional, naughty person who has no self control and who's stupid and and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, we've all we've all felt that way. So, you know, we try to, to do what's expected of us, which, which by default means you have to be a bald-faced fucking liar in, in order to, you know, to accomplish that. So, we've been on the other side of that coin, too. So, you know, let's not judge, lest he be judged, right? So, speaking of that judgment, because um, there's no such thing as judging others without judging self, that brings us into number five, negative self-talk. Now, a misconception people have with that is like, oh, I can't, I can't negative self-talk myself. And okay, that goes back to the whole negative thinking thing, like negative meaning things that ego really doesn't like. So if you have some problems within yourself, see, number two is more like the external mess. So like number five is like the internal mess, right? So it's like if you have problems within yourself, messes within yourself that need to be cleaned up and can be and and you have full capability whether you realize it or not but your your false ego that societally programmed little ego not like not not the ego you're born with not the one that says though yes granted i'm i'm one with all creation at the same time i'm also a separate entity called i called me that is separate from all the other people and the tables and the chairs and stuff so that awareness, that self-awareness that looks around and goes, oh, I'm me. That's the true ego. That's that, that you know, the, the self-identity, you know, being able to know that you're not the, the, the chair or the table and 
that you know you have that self-awareness that's that's the true ego that's the healthy ego the false ego is that societally indoctrinated Stockholm syndrome piece of shit that is drilled into us through the Nazi indoctrination system <laughs> we like to call school yeah um, and you know and the mainstream media and all sorts of other influences and etc but yeah you know the societal programming that's that's the false ego that's what most people refer to as the ego it's not even the ego it's the false ego it's a fallacy it's 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 a scam it's you know we've been we've been duped we've been hoodwinked we've been fucking lied to and most of the people that have lied to us have done it completely unintentionally they're just passing on their own ignorance to the next generation <laughs> and so you know there was no nefarious agenda on the part of most people some, yes, but an absolute minority, and you're probably never going to meet any of those. So, most, if not all, the people that have ever, you know, given you any of that nasty programming, completely unintentional, there was, there was no big conspiracy against you on their part. So, yeah, once we kind of connect the dots between 2 and 5, going from the external to the internal, and we stop having this false ego rage and all this stupid fucking judgment, then we're not in denial, then we're not pushing it down, then we're not like, oh, I, I can't look at that, because, you know, I have to give up negative self-talk, I can't tell myself, you know, I'm an alcoholic, so I need to get some help, because that's negative self-talk, and I can't do that, so I'm just going to happily drink this beer or ten and just, you know, rot out my liver until I die in 10 years yeah so it's like no it's it, you know coming to terms with the fact that you know maybe you got a problem with something maybe you need to sort that out that that is not negative self-talk at all that is that is just looking at a problem and being like all right i see this mess it needs to be cleaned up it's a very positive thing actually to view it as a positive opportunity for positive change and go well you know once i clean up this internal mess or messes or whatever it is i'll be happier i won't have so much anxiety i won't be so stressed i won't i won't um be holding myself back i won't be feeling so weighed down and wow things will be better so that is not negative self-talk at all what actual negative self-talk is, is, I'm worthless. I'll never amount to anything. I'm not handsome. I'm, I'm not pretty. I'm not smart. I'm not creative. I'm not intelligent. I can't ever do or have any of the things that everybody else has and blah, blah. And it's like, all right, look. Obviously, exceptions to every rule. Those exceptions are the extreme minority, so there's like a really damn good chance that you're probably not in the minority. So, you probably actually do look halfway decent, unless you've been like gang raped by a barrel of shovels, and you're like totally disfigured, and you know, like looking like worse than Igor and shit. Then chances are, you probably look halfway decent. And, you know... If you got like some acne problems or something, you're probably just over fucking stressed, which creates excessive acne. So like, if you chill the fuck out on yourself, that's probably gonna slowly over time like go down. Um, if you got a lot of extra weight on you, it's like a coat. It comes on, it goes off. I mean, I used to be ungodly overweight. I couldn't lose one fucking <laughs> iota of it until I stopped bashing the shit out of myself. Cause guess what? When, when the brain goes into fight or flight in that protection mode, in that distress mode, it doesn't know the difference between you being depressed about your self-image and, oh my god, there's a famine and a drought and there's no resources and I'm in terror. So when the body thinks that there's just not going to be enough to go around, then no matter what you eat, no matter what you do, no matter what your diet, its safety mechanism is to pack on the fat. Yeah, it is. So, regardless of what situation you're in physically, whether it's a bit overweight or acne or this or that or whatever, you know, you're, these aren't things that are you. These aren't things that you're fated to or whatever, you know. 
there are remedies if you're willing to, you know, to, to do the work and do the research and, you know, face yourself and stop giving yourself such a nasty fucking hard time, you know. And as far as intelligence, creativity, etc., like, unless, like, literally you got, you know, another nice little um, sexual analogy here, got gang raped by a barrel of electric screwdrivers and you've got, like, crap loads of, like, literal, like, physical brain damage that is literally preventing neurons from firing that, that completely disable you from being creative or intelligent or whatever, so, like, yeah, it, unless, like, mommy dropped you as a child, like, 15,000 frickin' times on your head or whatever else, then... Chances are you don't have chronic, near-fatal, unrecoverable frickin' brain damage. So that actually kind of means you've got just as much creative, intellectual, etc., 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 potential as the vast majority of all other humans out there that are equally brainwashed into thinking, oh, woe is me, I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm not worth anything, who's gonna care what I have to da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and you know what? If you just have the courage to face yourself and be yourself, you're always going to have people who like you and who love you, you know, especially once you stop pushing them the fuck away. And at the same time, you're always going to have your haters. You're always going to have people that just aren't happy unless they just aren't happy. So I would really suggest, like, coming to terms with that and owning that. That you can be very well liked. That is very possible for you. But the simultaneous consequence to that is you're also going to be very well hated because you can't please everybody. All the things that you do and you say and that you are that make one group of people love you, that they're looking at you like, wow, that is awesome. Another group of people is going to puke and vomit and find you insufferable and go, oh my god, that person. Eh. And it's, it's unavoidable. So the sooner you come to terms with the fact that you're just not going to please everybody, you'll be better off. Okay, procrastination, also known as laziness, but I prefer to refer to it as paralysis, fear-based paralysis. That's, yeah, that's, you know, definitely is one of the subheadings under that. What happens if you obsessively, neurotically try to stop procrastinating? Oh my god, I've got to give up procrastination is one of my eight things. I have to stress and struggle and suffer to not procrastinate anymore. You're going to procrastinate more than ever because you're going to be so stressed and so paralyzed and so driving yourself fucking nuts. That, like, before, your procrastination was just going to, like, mild paralysis. Like, eh, I don't think I want to go over there and do that because... There might be something over there that reflects some internal fear that I don't feel like facing. This is kind of like a mild thing there, right? You could just like casually procrastinate. But now it's like, terror! Oh my god, I'm procrastinating! Ah, I can't do that! Ah! And you're just like going to even more of a mode of procrastination because you're just paralyzed by all this massive anxiety and it oscillates and it gets really neurotic and fucking stupid. So yeah, the, the key to learning how to not procrastinate, stop judging yourself for freaking procrastinating. You know, let go of that, let go of the judgment. I mean, on all of these, it's letting go of the judgment, really. Does, doesn't every freaking so-called holy book say that anyway? It's not like the big fucking thing, like rule number one, don't, don't, you know, um, fucketh over others as you would not like to have them fucketh over and fucketh with you. You know, that's rule number one. Rule number two is like, don't judge shit. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge others. That doesn't mean don't dislike people. That doesn't mean don't have critical opinions. That doesn't mean it's got to be bunnies and fairies and kumbaya around the campfire. It doesn't mean have no negative opinions. It just means have no judgment. Don't, don't be like, that can't be. That violates the law of blah, blah. Judgment is that self-righteous addiction to just feeling 
justified, judgment, justified, there's the J's, look at that, yeah, it's just like that neurotic, psychotic, how dare they defy me, but what does God need with Starship, he dare doubts me, he requires proof, here is the proof that you seek, Okay, any Star Trek fans just totally know what I did there. But yeah, so it's about drop of the judgment. So yeah, that moves us into number seven, fear of success. Ooh, but fear of success really isn't fear of success, is it? It is A, addiction to our comfort zone. Comfortable meaning not that we like it, but that we're used to it. We know how to navigate it. We're confident. We know it well. Oh my god, I am so familiar with navigating all of this misery. I'm completely comfortable with it. I know it well. It's hostile terrain, but damn it, I know it like the back of my hand. I can navigate it. I can zigzag in and out of it. I've been used to it for so long. I'm comfortable with it. This is my comfort zone. And oh, I don't want to do all of that really scary expanding of my comfort zone because... That's uncharted territory. That's an alien land where the laws of physics work completely different, and I know nothing about it, and that's not safe, so I need my little space base and stay in my comfort zone of misery and hell. Like Hitler was saying, it's not really all that hard to reverse the ideas of heaven and hell, because then heaven can become avoiding a worse hell. Like, I'm in hell, but you know what? At least it's better than a lot of other things. But that's a scam. So really, fear of success is fear of loss. Oh my god, what if I go into this foreign alien realm of success, and I'm there, and I'm loving it, and I'm enjoying it, and then someone does something, or I do something, or for whatever reason it all gets taken away, oh my god, then it'll, it'll just be more misery than I was feeling before, oh god, the, oh, the pain, it's better to just stick with the devil I know, deal with the devil you know, stick with the misery you know, oh man, it's, you know, be better to stay in my rotting cesspool misery hole than, than to be free and liberated and happy and then have all that just taken away and woe is me and now it feels so much worse and so much more pain. Oh. That's, that's the fear of success right there. That is like, bam. That is like exactly it. That's why why, you know, a lot of guys are really intimidated by strong women or nice girls and things like that, or don't even think nice girls exist. They think they're all bitches and hoes, because, hey, you know what? At least if they're all bitches and hoes, you can't get hurt, because you've already, like, hurt yourself in advance, man. So you're like a big, tough motherfucker. Yeah, I can chew fucking glass, and the bitches and hoes ain't got nothing on me. Yeah. You know, and just like the girls that think only assholes exist and, like, totally, like, refuse to believe nice guys exist. It's not that they like assholes, honestly, for the majority of them. It's not that they like assholes. It's the idea of, oh my god, I'm used to dealing with assholes. All I know how to do is be a bitch to assholes. I've never been taught how to have a mutually respectful friendship or relationship with anybody. So what if I get this nice guy and he's real nice and then I, I hurt him because I'm not used to nice and I hurt him and I push him away and I really loved him and cared about him but but now I hurt him and that may, that's going to just make me like the biggest like queen bitch of the universe and I'm going to be like the worst person like ever in creation and I don't want to deal with all that all that guilt ah no ah so it's better to just think that all guys are jerks because at least if I think that then if I do hurt a nice guy hey I didn't know he was nice so ignorance is bliss and if the guy is an asshole well hey he deserves me being a bitch so you know it's all good either way you know I'm miserable and getting abused and see my self esteem keeps getting lower and lower and I'm self destructing and my body's got advanced aging because I'm stressing it out so much but you know, it's better than risking anything good happening, you know, so like that's where that shit is, you know, same with with business success, with money and all that, and what if I get all this money and then it ends up getting all taken away somehow, some way magically, 
or, or, you know, because money doesn't make anyone good or evil, it's not the root of all evil, it, it just, it amplifies what you already are. What if I'm a big horrible fuck-up and it amplifies my fuck-upness and I just fuck up like catastrophically way worse, like nuclear fuck-up. <laughs> fuck-up Armageddon. You know, so it's like, I don't want to do that, so it's better I just, nah, so I'll just, you know, live in a box or something and be miserable all my life. At least I won't be blowing up the universe with my nuclear fuck up! You know, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's that sort of thing. And again, if it's like, when you remove the fog, you know, things are kind of like driving a car. Obviously, if you, if you drive a car, like blindfolded and with your hands tied behind your back and your foot is slammed full force on the gas pedal, you're probably going to crash into something. But if you don't drive like that, if you drive with your eyes open and your hands on the wheel and you're fully aware and alert, chances are most likely you're probably not going to get into a car accident. You might, but very low probability. Very, very low, even though car accidents do happen all the time. It's still an amazingly low probability that you, the person listening right now, is going to end up in a nasty car accident because you know that as long as your eyes are open and you're paying attention to the road, you're driving responsibly, that most likely there's probably not going to be a problem. Most likely not. Same thing driving the road of life, my friends. So yeah, if you think that the only way to drive the road of life is blindfolded, with your hands behind your back, of course you're going to crash into shit, and you're going to get into trouble, and you're going to and you're going to get all this wonderful stuff and lose it and this and that and so on and etc. and everything you fear. But if you're just willing to let go of all that justification that that has to be the only real reality, and you're willing to learn something different, like, gee, maybe it's possible for little old you to drive without the blindfold on? Then maybe, just maybe, you don't have to suffer all of the before-mentioned things that we have gone over on this list. And as for number eight, people-pleasing, I think we already kind of covered that anyway. Like, because that is, like, so interwoven with all the rest, because why do we put on this fake facade well because we 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 doubt that being ourselves is good enough and when we think quote unquote negatively and we fear failure and and we're quietly criticizing others while we're people pleasing we're being so nice to their face but in our mind we're going that bastard and of course we're people pleasing because we're negative talking ourselves me being me isn't good enough so i have to try to be somebody else to please everybody else or i'm naughty and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah the big question now of course is If the initial context of this list, just by default, presents all these logical fallacies that most people are going to slip into, you know, they're going to run one way on the hamster wheel or the other, but no matter which road they take, all roads lead to Rome, you know, we're back to that, so. What can we do with this list that avoids that? Glad you asked, because I have recreated the list. I have put it into a different phrasing that should be up on your screen right now. And yeah, it's, it's a bit articulate, but it's not like ungodly brainiac impossible language or anything. It actually makes things a lot more clear. It is clear-cut language that doesn't pull any punches. It's not vague. It's direct. It cuts like a knife. So, the artist formerly named Doubting Yourself has turned into self-image logical fallacies. And for those people who do not know what a logical fallacy is, 
I will define it for you. It is two completely separate things, well, two or more, that though they are true, though they are factual, they don't directly link. But a bullshit story has been concocted to make it seem as if they link. Like, it would be as stupid as saying, for example, all right, it's true that there are X amount of million monkeys, apes, gorillas, etc. in the world, and it's true that they all pass gas, they all fart, and that that fart, that physical force of that fart, is wind, you know, that's why they call it breaking wind, right? So with all these monkey farts farting and creating all of this wind, well, that therefore means that all of the weather systems of the planet are created by apes and gorillas and monkeys and so on. Just farting, that, that is the, the number one only absolute fact of, you know, that's how weather systems are formed, monkey farts. So if all the, all the monkeys and apes and gorillas die, then there's going to be no weather system and there's going to be all this drought and famine and the earth's going to go out of whack and it's going to destroy itself. So, you know, you know, we definitely got to take good, good care of the monkeys and apes and stuff. Otherwise, the whole earth will just be destroyed. That is a logical freaking fallacy. Because you're taking truths like, yes, weather systems exist. Yes, weather systems contain wind. Yes, technically, breaking wind is a form of air movement. So, and yes, you know, monkeys fart. And so you're taking all of these facts, these truths, these, these things that exist, but they're not directly connected. They're very vaguely frickin' related, but you're linking them together in ways that they do not actually link. And you're doing so either to put yourself into a state of denial or to cater to a justification or both or, you know, etc. That is a logical fallacy, and we do that all the frickin' time. Especially when we look at our past, oh, woe is me. Everything the way it is, is the way it has always been. So therefore, that is the only way it could ever be. The proof's in front of me. I see it all around me all the time. I've seen it all my life. That is the only way reality is. That's the proof. That's the evidence. It's empirical. It's logical. So fuck you. That is a logical fallacy. A self-image logical fallacy. I'm miserable. I'm nothing. I'm worthless. And it's always been the case. It is the case. So it's it's always going to be the case, so dare now shut up. There's that justification to victimhood, that self-image logical frickin' fallacy, which leads into number two, self-destructive belief systems, because believing is seeing, not the other way around. Facts are wholly irrelevant because no matter what the facts are, we take action based on our belief systems and Guess what, boys and girls? All actions have consequences. If there's a belief system that's a complete load of shit and you take action on it, real, honest-to-God action, a real doing or not doing, because inaction is just a form of, another form of action. Just like nothing, it's just another form of something. Anyway, so if you do that, there's going to be a consequence, and if your actions are wise, consequences are probably going to be pretty sweet. I mean, hey, consequences getting all those lottery numbers is winning millions of dollars, right? That's cool. So, consequence is not a dirty word, but if you take ignorant, arrogant, justifiable, false ego action based on a total fucking bogus belief system, there's probably going to be some pretty nasty consequences. And then when those consequences drop down, oh, lo and behold, we go back to the self-image logical fallacy. See, that always happens. That's the only real reality. So people don't connect that you know. Maybe if you keep stabbing yourself with the fucking fork and you keep bleeding and you're in pain and you're going through all this, maybe the fork isn't forcing you against your will to grab onto it and stab your leg, maybe you just have a belief system that the fork is demonically possessed and forcing you to do that, when really it's not, it's just a damn fucking belief system. Number three, judgment of trial and error learning process, obviously. Um, number two relates back to negative thinking, number three is fear of failure. So instead of negative thinking, it's self-destructive belief systems. Instead of fear of failure, 
It is judgment of trial and error learning processes. Oh my god, you naughty boy, you naughty girl, how dare you make a mistake, you're, you're a worthless scumbag, you have to get everything right the first time, or fuck you, you fail at life. Yeah, it's, it's that, that kind of programming. Number four, psychological projections, which, again, leads to the whole criticizing others. And what did we say about that? About the judgment factor. The idea that, oh, they have no right to be who they are. They have to, to be who I say they are. Otherwise, they're a, they're a douchebag, and, you know, and, and getting all riled and justified so that then they can toss shit at you, and then you get all offended and goaded, and you end up going at it with them, and, you know, exact you know, description of, like, most online conversations, apparently, where people are going back and forth, no, fuck you, you're stupid, because you don't believe the way I believe, and, and it's not a belief system, I know the almighty facts of God, and you're just a duty, stupid, fuckhead, poo-poo face, and then, you know, the other person's acting the same way, and, like, neither person's realizing it, they're both feeling justified, they both think they have the almighty facts of the freaking universe, they, they both feel that they are completely logical and the other person's completely stupid. They're not respecting each other's rights to just agree to disagree, so they're trying to energetically vampire on each other. They're getting control freaky. They're doing the dick wag. They're playing the domination game. So yeah, psychological fucking projections. Number five, which formerly was negative self-talk and is now digivolved to... Obsessive affirmation of self-image logical fallacies. So, we already said the self-image logical fallacies. We already went through what that is. So, obsessive affirmation. Obsessive meaning you do it a lot. It's an obsession. You keep doing it and 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 doing it. And doing it. Affirmation. To continuously affirm to yourself, I'm stupid, I'm worthless, I'll never amount to anything, maybe I should just give up. I'm not pretty, I'm not handsome, I'm not creative, I'm not smart, I'm duty pooty waddy who. Everything that this dysfunctional society has tricked me into believing about myself. I'm going to obsessively, compulsively continue to affirm that to myself so that I can feel justified and self-righteous in my addiction to misery and justification. So I can arrogantly sit here in denial and blind ignorance to my own greatness so that I can be the eagle that thinks, thinks they're a chicken and never, ever, ever, ever fly because I say so and nini poo poo and I know better so fuck you, shut up. Yeah, that's, that's number five right there. So you see, this isn't rocket science. Number six, procrastination. Digivolve to disrespect of one's natural pace. See, that even uses simple words, disrespect. I think everybody knows what the fuck disrespect is, right? Of ones, in other words, to say, you know, you're the one that's being referred to here. So, of ones, of their, of my, you know. Disrespect of my natural pace, of your natural pace, of Joe Neighbor down the street's natural pace. Disrespect of one's natural pace. Natural meaning it's not forced. It's natural. You don't have to. You don't have to trick it or force it or beat it with a fucking stick or in any way get it to to do something it's not made to do because it's made to do it because it's freaking natural pace, you know, movement, like, like the pace, the rate, the flow, you know, you're walking at a, at a pace that's natural, that's comfortable, it's not too fast, it's not too slow, you know, you get the idea there, it's a disrespect of one's natural pace, aka procrastination, because when you procrastinate, you're disrespecting your pace, you're in paralysis, you're, you're, you're so afraid of doing anything, that you're just in this this lazy paralysis. Laziness is paralysis. It's fear-based paralysis. It's like, eh, I can't move. I'm too afraid because I'm I'm obsessively affirmationing to myself that I'm a loser. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So disrespect of one's natural pace. Number seven, formerly fear of success, digivolve to 
addiction to misery paradigms. Yes, that misery crack, nummy, nummy, numbs, that comfort zone that I am so familiar, I know how to navigate it. I don't like it, it's hell, but it's comfortable and I'm used to it and I know it well and I'm really good at it and if I, if I go anywhere else and do anything else, eh, that could be trouble, better to stick with the devil I know. Yeah, so that's number seven. And number eight, the last one, people pleasing. He thought I was going to say digivolve again, didn't you? Ha <laughs> ha. People pleasing gets transmuted into being inauthentic. Inauthentic mean, meaning not authentic. Like, a tree is authentically a fucking tree. It's not an elephant. You can tell yourself it's an elephant all you want. You can pretend to other people that it's an elephant. You could write books about how the tree is actually an elephant, but guess what? It's not a fucking elephant no matter what you do. So, we also call this in the hood, yo, frontin' opposing shit. Nigga be posing that motherfucker, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. Oh my god, was I just racist? Are the some from Justice Warriors gonna get all butthurt now and be like, Oh my god, what did he just do? <laughs> yeah, whatever. You, you got more issues with this fucking list than most people. Anyway, yeah, so being inauthentic. Not owning your emotions, not owning your thoughts, not owning your beliefs, not owning yourself. Basically, all, all this other shit that's on this list is, is aspects of being inauthentic. You're, you're not respecting your right to not be addicted to misery paradigm. You're, you're, you're not authentic in your natural pace. You're... You're not authentic in your self-image. You're not authentic in your in your view of yourself and others. You're not authentically allowing for that authentic, you know, trial and error learning process. You're not authentically allowing yourself to be creative instead of being destructive. You're not being authentic. You're creating all these self-image logical fallacies. That's that's being inauthentic. You know trying to be something you're not because you think that you being you just isn't good enough. So you think you have to be something else, someone else. So I'm not good I'm not good enough me being me. Well look, how the hell would you know? You haven't let you haven't allowed yourself to get to know yourself. I mean honestly if you really ask yourself, what the hell do you even know about you? If you got all these issues on this list, right, then how well do you really know yourself if you spent all this time being someone else? Putting on that mask. I am my age. I am my job. I I am my genre of music. I I am my career. I am my skill. I am my gender. I am my sexuality. I am no, you're fucking not. These things are your property. You own them. They don't own you. But, unfortunately, you spend all this time thinking that they do own you. Up until the point that you think, oh, that you are them. It's, it'd be like, I am my computer. My god, if you thought you were computer, you were computer. Yeah. If you thought that you were your computer, how easy would it be to get a computer upgrade? You know what I'm saying? You'd be fucking terrified. No, I can't upgrade. It'll kill me. I don't want to die. You know. So, yeah. But, Dave, you don't know me. <laughs> that makes two of us. Right? You know? If you've been, if you've been so busy getting used to and comfortable with and good at putting on this mask, putting on this facade, telling yourself how worthless this, that, and whatever you are, trying to please everybody else and trying to, to be everything but you, trying to think like everything you're told that you supposedly should think, but the one thing you're not thinking of is thinking the way you authentically think as you. And if you're trying to, to feel everything everyone says you should feel and avoid feeling everything everyone says you shouldn't be feeling, what the hell do you know about you? 
Honestly, I mean, can we have this honest conversation here without too many butts getting hurt? What do you honestly know about you? If you've been so freaking busy being anything but you. I'm not saying this with judgment. We've, we've all done this to ourselves. You know, as Jesus has said, he who's without sin casts the first stone, right? You know, there's there's nobody that hasn't, at least to some degree or another, done this to themselves. It's, it's what we're freaking taught to do. You know, we're not born into this world with a full, you know, mental hard drive full of everything there is to know about life. We are influenced completely <laughs> by our external environment. And unfortunately, our external environment likes to tell us, oh, you can't be you. Because guess what? People think they have to try to figure out how to be themselves. No, they don't. You're already you. Guess what? You were born you. You realize that? You were born you. As, as simple as that, uh, and uh, like a duh statement as that seems to be, really think about the profundity of that. You were born you, which means you don't have to go try to figure out how to be yourself. Oh my God, how do I be myself? What's that? How do I do that? Just drop all of the not being yourself and all that you're left with by default is you because you are you by default. Drop all when you drop all these masks, all these facades. I don't when I say drop all the masks, all the facades. I, I don't mean quit liking the music you like. I don't mean quit your job. I don't mean no. I, that's not what I mean. I mean in your mind, your your perception. You know, drop drop the perceptual blindfolds, even if it's only for like just a minute here. If it gets too uncomfortable, you could put the blindfolds back on. No worry, I'm not taking your blindfolds from you. There's no theft going on here. But just just for a moment, just remove the blindfold, even even if just for, for a few little seconds. The blindfold of poor little me. I'm supposedly this. I'm supposedly not that. I'm my job. I'm my this. I'm my that. I'm my gender. I'm my sexuality. I'm my age. I'm my race. I'm my blah blah blah. I should do this. I shouldn't do it. Da 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 da. I need to appease this. Blah 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 blah. I'm worthless. I'm blah 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 blah. All these things that you say, I'm this, I'm not that, I need to do this, I need to do that, da, 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 all that fucking shit. Just like drop it all for a second. Just like, just for a brief little moment, like hit the off switch on absolutely all of it. And what you're left with, check this out, here's the cool part. What you're left with is nothing. Like, no thing. Like, look at the word, nothing, no thing. You are not a thing. Things are your possession. You are a conscious human being. You are not a thing. You are not a, a tool. You are not an inanimate object to be used and taken for granted and thrown away. You are no thing. You are a sovereign fucking human being with, with rights. God-given rights you were born with. You are you. You are not a thing. You are not a tool. You are not an inanimate object. You are not a fucking candy wrapper. You are nothing. You are no thing. The things are your tools. The things are your property. The things are there at your disposable that you can disposal that if you so choose, you can use them to make your life better if you so choose. That's what tools are for. They're there to assist you. But you are not supposed to be the tool. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, instead of living in a world where we love people and use things, we live in a world where we use people and love things, and even to the point where we start seeing ourselves and other people as things. So instead of being in a world where we love people and use things, we love things and use people. And by love things, I don't even mean love, I mean like, like freaking like apathetic freaking consumerism like you know as much as i i agree with that old quote i also disagree with it too it's like yeah it's catchy it's like it rolls off the tongue but really we don't even we don't even love things we like we've been taught to be freaking consumers for fuck's sakes it's more like we've been taught to be addicted and to just not appreciate anything because if you can't appreciate who you are and what you got, 
you're not going to, pr to be able to appreciate anything you think you want, anything you think you need, anything you think that you're going to become or that you need to become because society's told you you're, you must or whatever. If you don't appreciate who and what you are and what you got right now, sorry. You're, you're going to be in for a lot of bad surprises when you find out that nothing's going to satisfy you. Because you have to start at that place of thankfulness and appreciation. Like, yeah, you know, things could be better, but not so bad. You know, there's people worse off than me. And yeah, there's people better off than me, too. But there's people worse off than me, and I'm looking around, and yeah, you know, basically, I got my health. I got a roof over my head. I got this, that, whatever, whatever it is you have. Yeah, I got that. That's, that's cool. I can appreciate that. Yeah. So, food for thought, right? Yeah? Remember, as Max Egan likes to say, belief is the enemy of knowledge. So, with that said, I believe it at that. Catch y'all later.